Looking like that. Okay. Welcome back to Steel on Steel. John Lofter here with you. Uh, is this a problem or a solution when you're bringing vouchers, say, into homeschools, private schools, alternative schools, if we went to this different system of funding how schools operate? Now, as I pointed out last week, before we get into the system of vouchers, the argument that you hear is that this will destroy the wonderful institution of public schools as it is and as it has functioned for so many years, ignoring the fact that it is in decline and a failing institution right now. The logical contradiction. So when this comes up in conversation, make sure you use this one. The logical contradiction that is there is if it's such a wonderful institution and we allowed parents to choose where they would like to send their kids, why would there be this stampede to the door? In other words, they don't want you to have vouchers because they'd be afraid it would be a stampede to the door of parents moving their kids to schools that worked and away from schools that don't work that they're telling you are so wonderful that they're afraid you're going to stampede from it. You follow this incredible logical breakdown. All right, now all of that aside, say you did solve it with vouchers. What comes with that? I have concerns about vouchers because wherever power and money goes, trouble grows and strings come attached with everything. So I wanted to talk with somebody else who has been thinking of that as well. Robert Davis he has 40 years of experience providing counsel for educational and not-for-profit institutions. Previously served as vice president for advancement at Bryan College in Tennessee. That is a U.S. state, right, Robert? Last time I checked. Uh, yes, it is. Last I, Last I checked, it was. And conductor and music director of the Brass Factory. Well, that sounds interesting. And conductor of the Cathedral Choir. Uh, tell me, you have four considerations for vouchers for Christian schools, I guess. If this comes in and we have school choice and suddenly we can do this, I can see certain things happening which aren't necessarily good. So let's go through your four considerations first. Before I get to that, you know, it's nice to know there are other people that felt they had to earn a living outside of music. Yes, yes, music is a sidebar. Couldn't support <laughs> I was just thinking of that yesterday, listening to some really interesting jazz. And I thought, you know, it's interesting as a musician, it's fun to make music, it's fun to produce it, perform it. Don't try to make a living out of it. <laughs> yeah, you have to be committed to poverty. The four considerations. Do you just want me to begin on those? Or do you I've opened the floor. The swimming pool is open. Dive off the diving board. Yeah. Dangerous. Well, a long time ago, as I mentioned in the piece that I wrote, I was considering vouchers simply because it came up at a committee meeting where I was on the faculty. I was also director of development for part of that time. And the committee member said, gee, they're talking about vouchers in the news. Should we consider them? And essentially, the discussion went nowhere. And it just dropped and we went on to other things. However... At that time, Dr. James Skillen had written an article, and I believe it appeared in Christianity Today, but he was asking the question about vouchers, whether we should take vouchers or whether we should consider tax credits. And, of course, the thing that I note is that with government money comes strings. Title IX is a great example of that. All of the restrictions that are placed on scholarship money, having been a vice president of a couple of different institutions, you see that with any of the scholarship money that comes in, You've got certain pressures that come down from the government. And this, of course, prompted a long time ago for Grove City College the consideration of refusing to accept government money at all. And Hillsdale College probably has capitalized on that more than Grove City ever has. But nevertheless, Grove City was the pioneer, and Grove City and Hillsdale has benefited as well by not accepting any of that money then they don't have to deal with the pressures of government to change their programs and uh, institute things they don't wish to. I had a college president tell me uh, about 15 years ago that he thought those both schools were stupid, and his explanation wasn't <laughs> very good. <laughs> but I thought it was, it was quite interesting. He came right out in that. It was at a, a colloquy that I hold annually in New York City on Christian education and culture. He just said it, and we dealt with it for a little bit and passed on to other things. But I think it's definitely wise to consider carefully. If you're going to accept the vouchers, are you prepared to deal with the pressures that come down? Should you work toward tax credits? My thought, and Jim Skillens at that time he wrote, appeared to be, yes, consider tax credits as being better because then it's still your money. You have it in your account and you're transferring it to the school. The second thing was tuition, and this 
tuition at Christian schools are determined by raising a finger into the wind to see which way the wind's blowing and how much you can raise. It's almost as good as in the secular schools where there's no rationale for tuition. Cost of living can go up 3% and tuition goes up 10 or 12%. There's no relation to any of it. In the Christian community, it's primarily a fear of raising it where students will stop coming. So they are more careful raising it, but nevertheless, they deal with it irrationally. In this case, if parents are going to have money available to them by not having to pay the local education tax, or at least getting a portion of it back, then should the Christian schools consider taking advantage of that and increasing their tuition? I'd say yes, simply because I'm a supporter of not having an artificially depressed tuition at Christian schools, but to raising it to cost and then deal with the fact that 10% increase in tuition would pay for the total amount that's required by scholarship applicants. So the tuition should also reflect the value of the education and come close to at least measuring the budget. Take the budget, divide by the number of students, that's tuition. The fact is everybody will not be able to pay that, but nevertheless, then you deal with the options and how you're going to solve that problem. And it's not all that difficult. You may experience in the first year a 10% decrease in enrollment. After that, it'll continue to grow. And that's my experience in working with schools around the country. The third item that I addressed was essentially uh, in Christian schools, you receive more for less. They operate more efficiently. Unfortunately, a lot of it's on the backs of the faculty who are paid very poorly. Nevertheless, you have fewer choices of academic courses. You have fewer electives from which you can pick. You have fewer choices in the musical areas and in the athletic areas, but the scores that students who are graduated from the Christian schools score higher on the standardized testing, do better on SATs, get into the same quality of schools that secular institutions boast. So they're getting more bang for the buck, so to speak, at a Christian school. It's just that a lot of the financial stench isn't there, and so you have to rethink a lot of the finances of Christian schools to make it better business, but that's the truth of the matter, more for less. And fourth, if you're going to do anything that has to do with vouchers or tax credits or tuition or the fact that you're getting more for less, you need to have a unified marketing plan, which is scarce to be found at most Christian schools. And as I said in the piece I wrote, I had one on my desk, and that's where it stayed. No one was interested in reading it. No one was interested in implementing it. And certainly no one was interested in paying the 10% of the total budget for marketing the institution. Christian schools tend to market when enrollment is down. My thesis was that they need to market always. And when times are good, when times are bad, they need to have their marketing plan in place and their advertising is out there soliciting students. That really breaks down within the institution when you start to consider things like the organizational chart. The head of a Christian school, 60% of his time is spent at least 60% away from the school as an advocate of the school, soliciting gifts and locating students for the institution. So many heads of schools have no idea what they're to do. They don't like to raise funding. They call in the consultant to help them raise money, and the first thing that the consultant does is suggest that the headmaster be fired because he doesn't like to raise money. So the marketing plan and the coordination with the head of school and the board is very important. And all four of these considerations are extremely important to the consideration of vouchers. You could probably come up with a number of others and perhaps even more profound ones than I've raised, but that was my feeling about it. Yeah, I think I would add on to that as you were talking I was sitting here writing. First of all, the idea of what happened to health care when health insurance came along. Prior to health insurance, medical costs were driven by the market. Okay, there was a cost and they had to make it affordable to people or it didn't work. As soon as free money, quote unquote, was available, the prices just went through the roof. And so now you have a lot of the same thing when you're setting tuitions, like wet finger analyses. Well, if there's a lot of, quote, free money, does that tend to pervert the institution, so to speak? Because all of a sudden the prices will begin to shift for tuition into how much can we soak the system for rather than what do we do efficiently? Because number two, uh, as you mentioned, government strings, and the reason it tends to come along is not only do you have ideologues like we have in the public school system today pushing certain agendas that they want to see in various schools, the problem is what about fake schools? Since we're talking about fake news out there, let's talk about fake schools where there's, quote, free money available 
And all of a sudden, people start creating schools, quote unquote, in order to, you know, the school of the first church of the second wing serpent or something like that. <laughs> That's a good one. Uh, in order to, to create a school, to create a sham. So you can see that one coming, too. But above all, what tends to happen, you have more and more intervention on the part of government trying to tack down all of these issues and then what constitutes genuine religion, what doesn't, or a genuine philosophy. And are you teaching all of the curricula that should be taught? And then the question is who determines curriculum? And the reason private schools are separate from public schools is they have a different view of curriculum than the public schools. And the third one that the argument that's going to come flying out is going to be that of state endorsement of religion, which I don't think it is. We allow it right now for the GI Bill and use government money to get that education towards a job. If the government gives out money to, you know, the Buddhists and the Jews and the Christians and the atheists, there's no endorsement there, you follow. So that argument could be defeated, but I know that that's the one the ACLU and the NEA are going to loudly trumpet. Yeah, and the one you mentioned about the curriculum and if the Christian school is genuinely a Christian school, that's come up before, and the interesting thing is is that you read in the brochures after you read that every school presents an excellent education, after the excellence comes in that they integrate Christian faith and learning. So many don't know what that means. And what happened in Hawaii some years ago, and I'm, I'm talking many years ago, a faculty member was turned down for hiring because he was said to not be a believer. And the school held to this integration position. When it was examined and taken to court after this person sued, they looked at the brochures and saw indeed that the school had advertised that they integrate Christian faith and learning. But when they examined the classroom and the syllabi, of the faculty, they determined that it wasn't included in the classroom, and so therefore their advertising was false. The school really wasn't Christian, and they had to hire the guy. Those kind of things become very important that you make sure, and, and one of the things that needs to be done in Christian schools is the consideration of Christian formation, and then that all goes down to what you say. Then they're going to say, yeah, well, this is a Christian school. We're supporting religion. I think it's going to come up. You're right. The support of Christianity. Okay, Robert Davis, let me do a station break right here. Chairman and CEO of the Consortium for Educational Advancement, a think tank serving Christian education. We're talking about the real entanglements that come with vouchers. Do you really want them? Coming up later in the program, Gordon Chang will join us. There are showdowns coming with China and North Korea that have real severe entanglements with them. And we're not watching them. In this country, we're watching our own navels right now, much less anything else. Tell your friends they can find our show on the major podcast sites and also our main site steelonsteel.com. I'm John Lefter. The program is Steel on Steel.